We're on page 30 of the agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, the governor's budget proposes $17 million and approximately $12 million general fund uh, to provide additional service coordinator positions at the regional centers. Um, uh, during legislative hearings last year, and it, uh, we heard the concerns from this subcommittee as well as the uh, assembly subcommittee that um, f federal funds were potentially being put at risk because of inordinately high uh, caseload uh, uh, ratios. And uh, this proposal uh, attempts to address that, at, at least a portion of it. Um, we estimate that the $17 million will provide approximately 200 positions at the regional centers. Obviously that number changes depending on what regional centers pay on a case-by-case -case basis. But um, we think that uh, with that, with those 200 positions, um, it's, it's approximately a third of what we estimate would probably be needed to get regional centers to a place where all caseload ratios were met. So where, you know, uh, developmental center movers were at ratios of one to 45, uh, home and community-based services waiver eligible consumers were at one to 62, and all others were at one to 68. So we're, we're not, we're not uh, this proposal doesn't get us quite there, but we think it's a step in the right direction. Um, and um, is your perspective of what's the ideal um, caseload ratio one to 45? It's um, one to 45 is what we estimate is appropriate for developmental center movers. And, and regional centers, their regional centers report to us on their ability to comply with caseload ratios. And none of the regional centers at this point are in compliance with at least one of the caseload ratio areas. Um, but the, this proposal also, as we talked about accountability a little earlier, and this proposal requires regional centers uh, to report back uh, to the department on an annual basis on the, uh, how the funds have been expended and the effectiveness of these funds in reducing the average caseload. Um, the, the agenda points out the concern that, you know, one of the things we have done is indicate that uh, we want to give regional centers flexibility in how these funds are used. And the question becomes, well, if we know we have a concern with uh, meeting the waiver requirements, why aren't we focusing all these resources on waiver eligible consumers and decreasing those caseloads? Um, and I think we would, the department would be concerned about attempting to uh, put that requirement on the regional centers. We believe that the regional centers have a, uh, a much more unique uh, perspective because of the day-to-day -day operations. They have, they've got better visibility into their caseload levels. And we know that caseload needs vary from center to center. Some centers have uh, a need for uh, uh, case managers to address their forensic populations. Some don't have that kind of uh, issue. So, and typically with forensic populations, you're having to have smaller caseload ratios, numbers like one to 15, things like that. So we think it's important to give regional centers the flexibility to address this. Um, because again, you know, the regional centers will be required to report back on how they've used these funds and the effectiveness of them. And, and we also think it, it ensures that, you know, with smaller caseload ratios, um, services will improve. And, and we don't think it's appropriate to just focus that on waiver eligible consumers. We want to see the provision of appropriate services for all consumers. LAO. Thank you, Madam Chair. As noted in your agenda, we are recommending approval of the governor's proposal for this increased funding um, to improve the consumer to uh, coordinator ratios um, and case management functions. However, we would note that there still remains a potential risk related to HCBS uh, waiver uh, caseload ratio requirements. Um, also noted, the special session actions would likely mitigate this risk, although it's unclear to what degree. Um, 
we note um, in our analysis that the legislature may wish to better understand kind of the implementation issues of tying or targeting these funds towards these federal funding requirements, um, noting that the entire proposed amount does not bring um, regional center uh, caseload requirements into compliance for all statutory requirements, including those tied to federal funding. Um, further, the, uh, the legislature may wish to um, explore what it would take to get into compliance for all statutory requirements. And public comment. Finance, I'm sorry, did you want to weigh in? Okay, great. Public comment. Evelyn Abuhasen with Disability Rights California. We certainly agree with reduced caseloads. We would like to see the uh, funding fo focused on uh, meeting the HCBS requirements and the HCBS requirements around person-centered planning. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Robert Harris on behalf of SEIU California. We haven't talked about all the other stuff we support the administration's done, including the budget proposals going forth. What we think is critical is the $51 million that's needed to actually reach the case load requirements is how you get people into the right services faster and more efficiently. And we would recommend the committee actually move that up to 51 million that would get the 600 people statewide that would actually make system-wide improvements. Thank you much. Thank you. Next witness, two minutes. Daniel Savino, Association of Regional Center Agencies. Uh, the association appreciates the inclusion of the 17 million in the governor's budget to allow regional centers to hire more service coordinators. Uh, the association shares the concern that targeting these positions to Medicaid waiver caseloads uh, because uh, certain individuals who don't qualify for Medi-Cal or who access only regional center case management services wouldn't benefit, so appreciate that recognition. Uh, in most, that most service coordinators do carry a mixture of waiver and non-waiver cases, so that's where the importance of flexibility in using that funding uh, comes into play. Tony Anderson, The Arc, California. Um, I wanna, for the record, agree with everything Evelyn said this time, and, um, and I'm a recovering case manager myself, and I do realize that if that, when your caseloads are as high as they are today, that you cannot do person-centered planning the way that the feds require you and really say that they should be done in, in California, and well, through the waiver. So um, if we do not have the numbers that we're, we're supposed to have, then you cannot get access to everything that's out there. You can't plan in the way that you need to plan. You can't bring in the team of people that are on your side. You can't do a real professional uh, process of getting people connected to their to their dreams. So um, I'm we're, we're very in support of this concept, uh, this proposal. We we know that there's probably more to it, um, but uh, this is a very great uh, first step forward. Thank you. Uh, we'll hold this item open. Moving on to issue number 11, increase vendor audit coverage. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, th uh, this proposal would uh, permanently establish seven uh, full-time vendor audit positions within the department's audit unit. The positions were originally established as two-year limited term in 2014-15. Um, the uh, addition of these seven positions increased our vendor audit staff from 11 to 18 positions. Over the last two years, these positions uh, focused on uh, backlog whistleblower audits, and we believe that by retaining these positions, they'll allow uh, more randomly selected vendor audits. Um, the agenda also um, uh, requests information on the, the 25 million that was uh, uh, identified in incorrect billings through these vendor audits over the last five years. Um, the, uh, and the, I wanted to specify that the, the total audit finding amount of 25 million um, represents all initial audit findings. 
So um, final amounts that are due to the department um, can often be uh, decreased by providers presenting information to back up their uh, claim that these were legitimate uh, charges that they had made and that and given that we um, we removed the findings when um, uh, when we looked at the 25 million amount to see you know what could actually be uh, brought in once we uh, uh, you know, adjudicated some of these claims. We came up with a total of 11.4 million, um, and uh, of this total, we've collected uh, to date 873,000. Um, of the outstanding amount that's due, there's um, 700,000 that is currently in collections. 3.5 million is in appeal with the vendors, so they're appealing uh, the findings. Uh, and there is 5 million that is in draft audit form where we've sent the, the draft audit to the provider and are waiting for responses from the provider. And then there's, finally, there's 1.3 million of this 11.4 million total that's um, likely uncollectible because we've had vendors that have closed without notice. And um, the, um, the agenda also asks about the policy issue for why we're not uh, looking at more uh, auditors. And, you know, like anything, I think it's a matter of competing priorities. Um, the the uh, our vendor audit staff um, would need to more than double to even address 10% of the um, vendors that we have that are uh, provide services above a million dollars. So um, uh, these, even though these 18 positions are only able to perform about 32 audits a year, we think that they're effective in, um, you know, the, the, it's a, it's a known quantity. Providers know that they, they can be audited, so it does provide some deterrent there to, you know, any kind of um, uh, conduct that may not be appropriate. Um, and we're understanding that we do have limited resources. We're also looking for ways to kind of better focus those audits so that we are looking at um, maybe providers that have had problems in the past or providers that um, are very um, high end, you have, have very high end expenditures, things like that that are, so those are kinds of things we're looking at to see if there's a way to better use these uh, 18 positions. So let me make sure I'm, I'm tracking so that there's, I got the impression, I think in my briefing, that on average your existing pool of auditors based on the number of audits you do per year are doing about two a year. Yeah, two per person, yes. Right, and is that a reasonable workload expectation from your perspective? You know, I, I think that it is given the amount of time that some of these audits can take. And, and again, it, it varies from provider to provider, but. For a large provider, there can be uh, the, the record keeping and the amount of documentation that has to be reviewed can be significant. Additionally, when there, um, the uh, auditors are required to come back and um, write up their reports, uh, run them through our legal office, work with legal on any issues that come up, a lot of times uh, vendors appeal, and so that appeal process can be very time consuming as well. So I, I think that you know, in, in certain cases, um, the, you know, being able to complete two full audits a year is an appropriate number. Okay, Ellie. Thank you, Madam Chair. As noted in your staff agenda, um, committee staff has requested that we look into what a reasonable level of audit coverage is, and so we are in the process of doing that. Great, thank you for that. Finance, public comment. Madam Chair, members, Dwight Hanson on behalf of the Alliance. We uh, have no problem with audits. I, I, I'm a little shocked, frankly, that a person can only handle two audits a year. That seems like an awfully low number. But um, regardless of that, 
the thing I would like to point out to you is that the term audit is being thrown around so regularly now that we're mixing what, what it really is supposed to be. And even in this conversation today, we've talked about two or three different kinds of audits. A billing audit is a pretty straightforward deal. You did, did you, you know, sort of provide the number of hours and that sort of thing. A fiscal audit, which is a broader look, is something that's now required. And there's state law out there that's got this all gummed up. They don't properly separate administrative, indirect, and direct cost. And as a result, we keep getting confusion about that. And then the whistleblower audit, which can be about uh, misbehavior and other sorts of things, is an entirely different audit as well. So I would ask as we go forward with this issue, while we have no problem with these positions, that you maybe provide some oversight and some guidance to the department as to what they want to focus these audits on, what would be the highest priority for those audits. And in fact, if, if there's a mix and match on that, it may require a different kind of auditor than the one that's being required here. So with those comments in mind, again, not opposed at all to the audit requirements. I just think we need some clarification. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next witness, no one else. We're gonna hold that item open. Moving on to issue number 12. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, the governor's budget proposes a trailer bill language that would um, repeal the authority that's currently in statute for the a prevention resources and referral services program. As you'll recall, in 2009, uh, there were um, eligibility adjustments made to the Early Start program as part of a cost savings measure. The, um, in response to that, the prevention program was developed in 2011 to um, assist in providing referral services for families that weren't eligible for Early Start. Now we're eliminating that since Early Start's back. Exactly, and so now with Early Start back, um, this language is no longer necessary, and so we're proposing to delete it. LAO, finance, public comment. Thank you very much, we'll hold that item open. Uh, final item under Department of Developmental Services, issue 13, standards authorizing medical services by regional centers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, while this is not an administration proposal, um, as we understand the proposal, uh, what it would do is repeal a cost-saving measure that was implemented in 2009-10. As you're aware, the Lanterman Act requires um, regional centers to use generic services when they're available. Um, medical and dental services covered by Medi-Cal or private insurance uh, can't be purchased by regional centers unless um, the consumer or family can provide proof that the service has been denied by the insurance provider. Um, and, the, and the regional center has to make a determination that the um, appeal by the uh, consumer or the family lacks merit. And you know, th this has led to a concern that it delays the provision of services because of the need to go through this appeal process. Um, and originally when this proposal was put in place, the department estimated that it would save um, approximately $18 million, 17 million of that would be from the general fund. Um, however, we would, um, we need more current data on the frequency of the use of these, uh, of, of this deferral process to determine what a good number would be um, if this proposal were to move forward and we were asked to provide technical assistance. Thank you very much, appreciate you. LEO, finance. Michelle Baca, Department of Finance. Uh, we are opposed to this uh, restoration of this general fund savings proposal as it is not currently part of the governor's proposed budget. Mm -hmm. Thank you, public comment. Evelyn Abuhasen with Disability Rights California. We are supportive of the repeal of this section of the law. Um, it doesn't really save the state any money. And as we know, people that are low income and unsophisticated don't know how to maneuver the system. These are Medicaid um, paid you know, services. So regardless of which agency provides them, you're gonna get a, a match. Um, so we are supportive of the repeal. Um, and in addition to the extent that this continues to move forward, um, we think that there needs to be some additional um, assistance from service coordinators to help families navigate a very cumbersome system that they don't really understand. Tony Anderson, The Art California, in support of the repeal. Thank you. 
uh, Daniel Savino, Association of Regional Center Agencies, uh, will be considering this issue uh, presently. Uh, did want to sort of shoehorn in a couple other points that haven't been mentioned that didn't really directly tie to issues. Um, first of all, concerning reinstatement of cuts made during the recession, certain prohibited services, uh, certain underserved communities, Latino communities and others, uh, do, we do see consistent reporting that these services were oftentimes the most valuable services to their families, that they were something that meant a lot to them and were in some cases the only services that they wanted and uh, those services were cut. Uh, so these programs like social recreation and camp, uh, the cuts uh, had a very minimal impact on the budget but had a serious impact on communities that are underserved. So restoration of that is something we'd urge consideration of. And uh, lastly, uh, the idea that regional centers should be allowed to uh, help needed community providers on the verge of closure through uh, rate enhancements and uh, exceptions to the median rate. This type of stabilization authority would help ensure that uh, services can continue for people in the community. Thank you. We are gonna hold this item open. Uh, let me thank you, Ms. Bargman, Mr. Doyle, Mr. Knight, for sharing your afternoon with us. And again, welcome to you and your new job. And we'll be looking forward to continuing to work with you on critical issues facing your department. Thank you very much. We are now going to transition backwards, back to the beginning. And no, it's not that. As folks are adjusting, we'll just take a quick second to let me reorder my own agenda here so I know where I am. That might be helpful. Everybody settled, we ready? Great, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we are now uh, going to hear five issues under the Department of Rehabilitation, uh, item 5160, and we'll start with issue number one, the overview, page two of the agenda. Welcome. this on? Thank you. Yes. Senator Mitchell, if I could just have one quick second. I have to um, refine my place. My eight assistive technology Not decided to die for, so just me one quick Not second. Not a problem. You signal when you're ready. I'll put my feet up if you don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> so technology is great when you can depend on it and when it doesn't work, oh well. Well, when it fails us, we fall apart. I'll be right with you. Cool, thank you, I'm there. I can begin when you're ready. Ready when you are. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman, Madam Chairman, and thank you members of the committee for us to be here today to um, share the information with you and uh, to answer any questions that you may have. Um, the, oh my goodness, my technology is just not gonna behave today. So, my apologies. It, no problem. I, you're the man of the hour. I can wait. You find it. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm Tell just, me when you're ready. Almost right there. Hmm. Thank you. So, today I have with me... Um, 
our chief counsel, Kelly Hargreaves, and uh, Tina Watson, who's our assistant uh, deputy for administrative services. And my name is Joe Xavier, director for the Department of Rehabilitation. So today um, I wanted to share um, briefly with you some oversight or overview of our department and then um, at your pleasure talk about the three BCPs that we have. We have um, the Department of Rehabilitation provides services to over 100,000 individuals each year. We have about $443 million uh, budget. 21% of that is state dollars and the rest of that is federal funds. We have about um, 1,780 positions. And what's important is that for the um, 21 or for the every dollar of state dollars that we bring in, uh, we have four dollars of federal dollars. Um, we have uh, served over 100,000 individuals and we have opened our wait list of six times since 2011. And the reason that we do that is because when we're order of selection, we um, don't have enough money to serve all the people that have the need. We provide services to the most significantly disability. We we also have our um, independent living program, and in our independent living program, we have 28 independent living centers that uh, provide services to individuals so that they can continue to live in their community and, and be independent. There are 28 independent living centers that, that cover the geography of California. Um, they're nonprofit organizations. Cumulatively, they receive $20.6 million, $12.5 million of that is federal dollars, and then the balance of that is uh, federal uh, 12 and a half million of that is state dollars and the balance of that is federal dollars. We also have our older individuals who are blind program that uh, provide services to um, some 7,000 individuals and it's about $3.2 million of federal funds that are no state match for those programs. And then we have a traumatic brain injury program, the state $140,000 and we provide services to about 2,400 individuals um, through those seven programs. Um, we have four major initiatives that I wanted to touch on very quickly. One of them is our Promise Grant, and under the Promise Grant, we are providing, it's a study that you'll recall came before the Budget Committee uh, a couple of years ago. It's $55 million of federal money that is coming to California to do a study on the interventions to youth who are on SSI. And through those services to those youth, uh, through partnerships with five state departments and some 20 schools um, in the San Diego State University, we are testing interventions to reduce the reliance and dependence on public assistance for those individuals so that they can in effect move into employment and um, into independence in their community as they turn into adulthood. We are, that program has been in place and we have fully enrolled that program, some 3,000 youth, two months ahead of schedule, so we're very proud of that and the interventions are all well underway. In addition to that, I wanted to talk about our competitive integrated employment project that we have in partnership with the Department of Education and the Department of Developmental Services. Um, and that project is essentially to accomplish three goals. It is to align the systems of all three departments and our services so that we can improve um, our, our coordination there and is to build the capacity within those three systems as well as to uh, increase the capacity of the individual served by the three systems so that they can move into competitive integrated employment. We also have a work incentives pilot uh, our program that we implemented uh, this past, fully rolled out this past year, and that program is for the purposes of providing benefits counseling to individuals who are on supplemental social, uh, security income so that they can move into the competitive integrated um, employment. And of course, in moving into employment, it then generates the program income that we use within our department. The, Individuals are serving about 3,000 individuals out of a caseload of about 3,000. And so far, um, we've had very good success with it. 75% of the individuals who have gone to work, um, which is a greater number than what it was before we started providing the services, and of the 75% that have gone to work, 
58% of those are going to work at a wage that is substantial enough for them to reduce their reliance on public benefits. So if I could just turn over this briefly to my colleague, Ms. Hargreaves, who can provide you a brief update on the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Great, thank you. 